14. The Vampire Moon. Phobos means fear. In myth, he was the offspring of Aphrodite and Ares, the child of love and war. It's a fitting name for the larger of Mars' moons, formed long before the age of man, when a meteorite struck Father Mars and flung debris into orbit. The oblong moon floated like a cast-off corpse, dead and abandoned for a billion years. Now, it is the hive teeming with the parasitic life that pumps blood into the veins of the Gold Empire. Swarms of tiny, fat-bodied cargo ships rise from Mars' surface to funnel into the two huge gray docks that encircle the moon. There, they transfer the bounty of Mars to the kilometer-long Cosmos haulers that will bear the treasure along the great Julii Agos trade lines to the rim, or more likely to the core, where hungry Luna waits to be fed. The barren rock of Phobos has been carved hollow by man and wreathed with metal. With a radius of only 12 kilometers at its widest, the moon is ringed by two huge dockyards, which run perpendicular to each other. They're dark metal with white glyphs and blinking red lights for docking ships. They slither with the movement of magnetic trams and cargo vessels. Beneath the dockyards, and at times rising around them in the form of spiked towers, is the hive. A jigsaw city, formed not by neoclassical gold ideas, but by raw economics without the confines of gravity. Six centuries worth of buildings perforate Phobos. It is the largest pincushion man has ever built, and the disparity of wealth between the inhabitants of the Needles, the tips of the buildings, and the hollow inside the moon's rock borders on hilarious. Looks larger when you're not on the bridge of a torch ship, Victor drolls from behind me. Being disenfranchised is so damn tedious. I feel her pain. The last time I saw Phobos was before the lion's reign. Then I had an armada at my back, Mustang and the Jackal at my side, and thousands of peerless scarred at my command. Enough firepower to make a planet tremble. Now, I'm skulking in the shadow in a rickety cargo hauler, so old it doesn't even have an artificial gravity generator, accompanied only by Victra, and a crew of three sons, gas haulers, and a small team of howlers in the cargo bay. And this time, I'm taking orders, not giving them. My tongue plays over the suicide tooth they put in my back right molar after the howler initiation. Better than being taken alive, Severo said. I have to agree with him. Still, feels strange. In the aftermath of my escape, the Jackal initiated an immediate moratorium on all flights leaving Mars for orbit. He suspected the suns would make a desperate bid to get me off planet. Fortunately, Severo isn't a fool. If he had been, I'd likely be in the Jackal's hands. Ultimately, not even the Arch-Governor of Mars could ground all commerce for long. And so his moratorium was short-lived, but the shockwaves it sent through the market were staggering. Billions of credits lost every minute the Helium-3 did not flow. Several found it rather inspiring. How much of it does Quicksilver own? I ask. Victra pulls herself beside me in the known gravity. Her jagged hair floats around her head, like a white crown. It's been bleached, and her eyes have been blackened with contacts. Easier for obsidians to move about the rougher ends of the moon than it would be without a disguise. And being one of the largest howlers, she hardly could pass for any other color. Hard to guess, she says. Silver ownership is a tricky thing in the end. The man has so many dummy corporations and off-grid bank accounts, I doubt even the sovereign knows how large his portfolio is. Or who is in it, if the rumors of him owning golds are true. They are, Victor shrugs, which tips her backward. He's got his fingers everywhere. One of the only men too rich to kill, according to Mother. Is he richer than she was? Then you are? Where, she corrects, shakes her head. He knew better than that. 
There was a pause. But maybe. My eyes seek the silver-winged hill icon that is stamped on the greatest of Phobos towers. A three-kilometer-long double helix of steel and glass tipped with a silver crescent. How many gold eyes look on it with jealousy? How many more must he own or bribe to protect him from all the rest? Perhaps just one. Crucial to the jackal's rise was his silent partner. A man who helped him secretly gain control of the media and telecommunications industries. For the longest time, I thought that partner was Victor, or her mother, and he closed a loop in the garden. But it seems the jackal's greatest ally is alive and prospering. For now. Thirty million people, I whisper. Incredible. I can feel her eyes on me. You don't agree with Severus' plan, do you? My thumb picks at the wad of pink gum stuck to the rusted bulkhead. Kidnapping Quicksilver will get us intel and access to vast weapons factories. But Severus' play against the economy is more concerning. Several kept the sons alive. I didn't. So I'll follow his lead. Mm-hmm. She eyes me skeptically. I wonder when you started believing grit and vision were the same thing. Oi, shithead! Several squawks over the comm unit in my ear. If you're done sightseeing or humping or whatever the hell you're doing, it's time to tuck in. Half an hour later, Victor and I huddled together with the howlers in one of the Helium-3 containers stacked in the back of our transport. We can feel the ship reverberate beyond the container as it links its magnetic coupling to the dock's ringed surface. Beyond the ship's hull, oranges will be floating in mechanized suits, waiting to steer the weightless cargo containers onto magnetic trams that will in turn take them to the cosmos haulers awaiting the journey to Jupiter. There, they will resupply Roke's fleet in his war against Mustang and the Moon Lords. But before the containers are transported, Copper and gray inspectors will come to examine them. They'll be bribed by our blues into counting 49 containers instead of 50. Then an orange, bribed by our contact, will lose the container we're in. A common practice for the smuggling of illegal drugs or untaxed goods. He'll deposit it in a lower-level berth for machine parts, whereupon our son's contact will meet us and escort us to our safe house at least, that's the plan. But for now, we wait. Eventually, gravity returns, signaling we're in the hangar. Our container settles on the floor with a thud. We steady ourselves against helium-3 drums. Voices drift beyond the metal walls of the container. The hauler beeps as it decouples from us and returns out the pulse field to space. Then silence. I don't like it. My hand twists around the leather grip of my razor inside my jacket sleeve. I take a step forward toward the door. Victor follows. Several grabs my shoulder. We wait for the contact. We don't even know the man, I say. Dancer vouched for him. He snaps his fingers at me to return to my place. We wait. I notice the others listening. So I nod and shut my mouth. It's ten minutes later that we hear a solitary pair of feet click against the deck outside. The lock thuds back on the container doors, and dim light seeps in as they part to reveal a clean-cut, goateed red with a toothpick in his mouth. Half a head shorter than several, he clicks his eyes over each of us in turn, one eyebrow climbing upward when he sees Ragnar. The other follows when he looks down the muzzle of several's scorcher. Somehow, he doesn't step back. Man's got a spine in him. What can never die? Several growls in his best obsidian accent. The fungus under Ares' sack. The man smiles and glances over his shoulder. Mind lowering the nasty. We gotta move. Now. Borrowed this dock from the syndicate. Except they don't really know about it, so... Unless you want to tangle with some professional uglies. We gotta box the jabber and waddle on. He claps his hands. Now means now. 
Our contact goes by the name of Rolo. Stringy and wry, with sparkling bright eyes, and an easy way with the woman, even though he brings up his wife. The most beautiful woman who has apparently ever walked the surface of Mars. At least twice a minute. He also hasn't seen her in eight years. He spent that time on the hives as a welder on the space towers. Not technically a slave like the Reds in the mines. He and his are contract labor. Wage slaves who work 14-hour days, six days a week, suspended between the megalithic towers that puncture the hive, welding metal and praying they never suffer a workplace injury. Get an injury you can't earn. Can't earn, you don't eat. Mighty full of himself, I overhear several saying under his breath to Victor in the middle of the pack as Rollo leads on. I rather like his goatee, Victor says. The Blues call this place the Hive, Rolo sang as we head toward a graffiti-smeared tram and a derelict maintenance level. Smells like grease, rust, and old piss. Homeless vagrants festoon the floors of the shadowy metal halls, twitching bundles of blankets and rags that Rolo sidesteps without looking, though his hand never leaves the worn plastic hilt of his scorcher. Might be to them. They got schools, homes here. Little airhead communes, sex to be technic, where they learn to fly and sync up with the computers. But let me learn you what this place really is. Just a grinder. Men come in, towers go up. He nods his head at the ground. Meat goes out. The only signs of life from the vagrants on the floor are little gouts of breath that plume up from their lumpy rags, like steam from the cracks in a lava field. I shiver beneath my grey jacket and adjust the bag of gear over my shoulder. It's freezing on this level. Old insulation, probably. Pebble blows a cloud of steam through her nostrils as she pushes one of our gear carts, looking sadly left and right at the vagrants. Less empathetic, Victor guides the cart from the front, nudging a vagrant out of the way with her boot. The man hisses and looks up at her. And up. And up till he sees all 2.1 meters of annoyed killer. He skitters to the side, breathing through his teeth. Neither Ragnar nor Rolo seem to notice the cold. Sons of Ares wait for us on the run-down tram platform and inside the tram itself. Most are red, but there's a good amount of oranges and grains and blue in the mix. They cradle a motley collection of old scorchers and strafe the other hallway that leads to the platform with edgy eyes that can't help but jump our direction and wonder just who the hell we are. I'm thankful more than ever for the obsidian contacts and prosthetics. Expecting trouble? Severo asks, eyeing the weapon in the sun's hand. Gray's been sweeping down here in the last couple months. Not hollow-ass tin pots from the local precinct, but naughty bastards, legionnaires. Even some thirteenth mixed in with the tenth and fifth. He lowers his voice. We had a nasty month. Where they shred us up real bloody damn bad. Took our headquarters in the hollows. Stuck syndicate tufts on us too. Paid to hunt their own. Most of us had to go to ground. Hiding in secondary safe houses. Main body of sons have been helping the Red Rebels on the station. Obviously but our special ops hasn't flexed muscle till today. We didn't want to take chances, you know? Ares said you got a lot of important business. Ares is wise, Severo says dismissively. And a drama queen, Victor adds. At the door to the tram, Ragnar hesitates, eyes lingering on an anti-terrorism poster pasted onto a concrete support column in the tram's waiting area. See something? Say something, it reads, showing a pale red with evil crimson eyes and the stereotypical tattered dress of a miner skulking near a door that says restricted access. Can't see the rest. It's covered in rebel graffiti. But then I realize Ragnar's not looking at the poster, but at the man I didn't even notice who crumpled on the ground beneath it. His hood's up, left leg in an ancient mech replacement. A crusted brown bandage covers half his face. 
There's a puff, the release of pressurized gas. And the man leans back from us, shivering and smiling with perfectly black teeth. A plastic stim cartridge clatters to the floor. Tar dust. Why do you not help these people? Ragnar asks. Help them with what? Rollo asks. He sees the empathy on Ragnar's face and doesn't really know how to answer. Brother, we barely got enough for flesh and kin. No good sharing with that lot, you know. But that one is red. They are your family. Rollo frowns at the bare truth. Save the pity, Ragnar, Victor says. That syndicate crank he's puffing. Most of them would slit your throat for an afternoon high. They're empty flesh. Empty what? I say, turning back to her. She's caught off guard by the sharpness of my tone. But she's loath to back off, so she doubles down instinctively. Empty flesh, darling, she repeats. Part of being human is having dignity. They don't. They carved it out themselves. That was their choice, not gold's. Even if it's easy to blame them for everything. So why should they deserve my pity? Because not everyone is you, or had your birth. She doesn't reply. Rollo clears his throat, skeptical now about our disguises. Led his right about the slate your throat part. Most of them were imported laborers, like me. Not counting the wife. I've got plus three in new Thebes that I send money back to. But I can't go home till my contract's up. Got four years left. These slags have given up on trying to get back. Four years? Victor asks dubiously. You said you were already here eight. Gotta pay for my transit? She stares at him quizzically. Company doesn't cover it. Should have read the fine print. Sure, it was my choice to come up here. He nods to the vagrants. Was theirs too. But when the only other choice is starving. He shrugs, as if we all know the answer. They slags just got unlucky on the job. Lost legs. Arms. Company doesn't even cover prosthetics. Lace not decent ones. What about carvers? I ask. He scoffs. And who the hell do you know that can afford flesh work? I didn't even think of the cost. Reminds me of how distant I am from so many of the people I claim to fight for. Here's a red. One of my own, more or less. And I don't even know what type of food is popular in his culture. What company do you work for? Victor asks. Why, Chulei Industries, of course. I watch the metal jungle pass outside the dirty door glass window as the tram pulls away from the station. Victor sits down next to me, a troubled look on her face. But I'm a world away from her, my friends. Lost in memory. I've been to the hive before with Arch Governor Augustus and Mustang. He brought the Lancers to meet with society economic ministers to discuss modernizing the moon's infrastructure. After the meeting, she and I snuck away to the moon's famous aquarium. I'd rented it out at an absurd cost and arranged a meal and wine to be served to us in front of the orca tank. Mustang always liked natural creatures more than carved ones. I've traded fifty-year-old wines and pink valets for a grimmer world with rusting bones and rebel thugs. This is the real world, not the dream the golds live in. Today, I feel the silent screams of a civilization that has been stepped on for hundreds of years. Our path skirts around the edges of the hollows, the center of the moon where the latticework of cage slum apartments festers without gravity. To go there would be to risk falling into the middle of the syndicate street war against the sons of Ares, and to go any higher into the mid-color levels would be to risk society marines and their security infrastructure of cameras and hollow scanners. Instead, we pass through the hinterlands of maintenance levels between the hollows and the needles, where reds and oranges keep the moon running. 
Our tram, driven by a son's sympathizer, speeds through its stops. The faces of waiting workers blur together as we pass. A pastiche of eyes, but faces all grey, not the colour of metal, but the colour of old ash in a campfire. Ash faces, ash clothes, ash lives. But as the tunnel swallows our tram, colour erupts around us. Graffiti and years of rage bleeding out from the ribbed and cracking walls of its once grey throat. Profanity in fifteen dialects. Golds ripped open in a dozen dark ways. And to the right of a crude sketch of a reaper scythe decapitating Octavia Aulun is an image of Eo hanging from the gallows in digital paint, hair aflame. Break the chains, written diagonally. It's a single glowing flower among the weeds of hate. A knot forms in my throat. Half an hour later, we set out. Our tram grinds to a halt outside a deserted low-color industrial hub, where thousands of workers should diverge from their early morning commute from the stacks to attend their functions. But now, it's still as a cemetery. Trash litters the metal floors. Hollow cans still flash with the society's news programs. A cup sits on a table in a cafe, steam still rising off the top of the beverage. The sums have cleared the way only a few minutes before. Shows the extent of their influence here. When we leave, life will return to the place. But after we plant the bombs we brought with us, after we destroy the manufacturing, won't all the men and women we intend to help be just as unemployed as those poor creatures in the tram station? If work is a reason for being, what happens when we take it away? I'd voice my concerns to several, but he's a driven arrow, as dogmatic as I once was. And to question him aloud seems a betrayal of our friendship. He's always trusted me blindly. So am I the worst friend for having doubts in him? We pass through several grab lifts into a garage for garbage disposal haulers, also owned by Julii Industries. I catch Victor wiping dirt off the family crest on one of the doors. The speared sun is worn and faded. The few dozen red and orange workers of the facility pretend not to notice our group as we file into one of the hauler bays. Inside, at the base of two huge haulers, we find a small army of sons of Ares. More than six hundred. They're not soldiers, not like us. Most are men, but there's a scattering of women. Mostly younger reds and oranges forced to migrate here for work, to feed Marside families. Their weapons are shoddy. Some stand, others are seated turning from conversations to see our pack of obsidian killers stalking across the metal deck, carrying bags of gear and pushing two mysterious carts. A small sadness grows in me. Whatever they do, wherever they go, their lives will be stained by this day. If it were my duty to address them, I'd warn them of the burden they're taking on the evil they'll be letting into their lives. I'd say it's nicer to hear about glorious victories in war than to witness them, than to feel the weird unreality of lying in bed every morning, knowing you've killed a man, knowing a friend is gone. But I say nothing. My place now is beside Ragnar and Victra, behind several as he spits out his gum and stalks forward, giving me a wink and an elbow on the side to stand in front of the small army. His army. He's tiny for an obsidian mill, but still scarred and tattooed and terrifying to this company of small-handed garbage men and hunched tower welders. He tilts his head forward, eyes smoldering behind his black contacts.
Wolf tattoos looking evil against his pale skin in the industrial light. Greetings, grease monkeys. His voice rumbles, low and predatory. You might be wondering why Ares has sent a pack of hardcore nasties like us to this tin shithole. The sons look to one another, nervously. We aren't here to cuddle. We aren't here to inspire you or give long-ass speeches like the bloody damn sovereign. He snaps his fingers. Pebble and Clown wheel the carts forward and unlatch the tops. The hinges squill open to reveal mining explosives. We're here to blow shit up. He throws open his arms and cackles. Any questions? <laughs>